almost no pain. I started recording late. Actually, I was a little confused, I think, about the... the um, Timing. No, about the link. And I think I, I opened the... I think I opened the wrong link. So I was waiting for you guys while Tim <clears throat> was uh, frantically messaging me. Where are you? It was not frantic. It was desperate. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Distinction notice. noted. <laughs> Without a difference. Um, you're, you're, you're not really uh, in, in great uh, but focus, Tom. You're usually crisp. And it's, it's sort of... Um, That's sort kind of dark. Like, now the yeah. screen is dark here. I am? Yeah. No. You, um, no, I was thinking of Tim. 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 Tim always oh. has the window behind him yeah. and therefore doesn't there. have good light. Tim, I'm. Uh, oh, there you are. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know because the image that I see of myself. Let me see. The image I see of myself is. Um, Quite clear. I think not I'm, clear to me. Not, not yeah. for me either. So but well, maybe, maybe the Russians are trying to hack into this conference, and they're and they're slowing down the uh, internet speed. Well, that might be. How about here's here's a different camera. Is this one better? Yeah. Uh huh. It's better. I don't think it does anything for the resolution, but but it's much better. Oh, okay. Because I'm using an attachment that actually uses my uh, iPhone in order to um, uh, in order to be the camera for the computer, and so I, I maybe something's out of adjustment or whatever. Well, anyway. if it helps you to know the small image on the top is very sharp, but the larger image in the middle of our screen is what is less sharp, so. Um, I don't know, that, that helps me, I guess. Uh, I, <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think we're all okay. okay. Don't, don't worry about it. I'm sorry. Call, Tim. Let's not worry. Yeah, yeah I okay. mean, we got, I a, got few, it. a few other topics, right? Yep. Yeah, who would want to see yeah. a crystal clear image of any of our faces anyway? Oh my God, you know. Oh, that's what you're doing, Tim. I have your pardon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, Ned, on my screen, you're the clearest. Hey. Uh, yeah. yeah, your image is the clearest and brightest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ned, you, you definitely are. He always was, though. Anyway. That's that was anyway, the clear you know, the right. Yeah, well, who else is coming onto this call with a lot of <clears throat> anxiety and uh, worry about the world situation? Oh, geez. I don't know. Last uh, night, I, I was having a hard time sleeping. Well, Gary, yeah. Gary is somewhere near um, the Caribbean. He's doing the Caribbean cruise, so I don't know where he is. Yeah, hi, Gary. I hope you're doing okay. You're yeah. listening, Gary or watching later or whatever, or at least with us in spirit. Hi, Gary. We miss you. And then uh, Fred, of course, is, I guess they're not having a snow day. Yeah. So um, shall we pray? Would, would you like to use the one that... Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Well, there, there's two. There's the the edge of war prayer and the fasting prayer. I suggested the edge of war prayer that came from um, Terry Hershey, and John suggested the fasting prayer. Or go for war. and I suggested the fasting prayer for the end of our session. <clears throat> Actually, you, you suggested a dust prayer. Oh, okay. that's okay. Earlier. Whichever, John, whichever. Yeah. Well, let's do the. John, you. 
let's let's do the edge of war then. Yeah. yeah okay. Sure. Um, and let's see if I can get this on here as a share the screen. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Got it. Uh, I don't know if this would work if we all try to recite it together. So, shall I? Why don't we, we alternate sentences? Oh my God, George, you're going to coordinate that? <laughs> uh, no, and the second sentence is also long. Yeah, very long. Tom, I vote you do it. Okay. Here, here. Oh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. On the edge of war, one foot already in, I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles. I pray that stone hearts will turn to tender heartedness, and evil intentions will turn to mercifulness. And all the soldiers already deployed will be snatched out of harm's way. And the whole world will be astounded onto its knees. I pray that all the God talk will take bones and stand up and shed its cloak of faithlessness and walk again in its powerful truth. I pray that the whole world might sit down together and share its bread and wine. Some say there is no hope, but then I've always applauded the holy fools who never seem to give up on the scandalousness of our faith, that we are loved by God, that we can truly, that we can truly love one another. I no longer pray for peace, I pray for miracles. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So, Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. 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 <clears throat> For some reason, that reminded me of the passage in Slaughterhouse Five, where uh, I guess what's his name, Billy Pilgrim, is having, I think, a dream where he sees the bombs falling from the sky on Dresden in reverse order. So the bombs are miraculously ascending into these airplanes, which have their bomb bays open to receive them, and then flying back to England. Uh, and then the bombs are taken to ships and taken across the Atlantic to factories in the United States where they are loaded onto assembly lines going backwards. And, and he says something like, Kurt Vonnegut says something like, uh, and at a particularly tender touch, they are disassembled by women um, uh, working the assembly line and packed away and then taken off in trains, the, the materials are, the phosphorus, et cetera. Uh, take it off in trains to uh, the countryside where they are placed back in the earth so that they will never be able to hurt anybody ever again. Uh, and he's got this whole, do you uh, remember that anybody? I don't remember it, but I'm glad you brought it up. It's, it's yeah, seems very <clears throat> timely. Yeah, It's a uh, good <clears throat> old Kurt. It's a wonderful dream. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Tom, are you saying mass this weekend somewhere? No, I am right here. Um, a couple of friends of Karen are coming down and going to join us for mass in the living room here. Oh, great. So, one of them is a former teacher of hers. She used to be the principal at... Um, Ascension School in, in South LA. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I have the Fairfield firm. And so let me ask you guys a question. Um, that this has nothing to do with Ukraine, has nothing to do with our spiritual lives, but I've become aware in the last several months of how, this is a football, college football thing, okay, of how many top flight football players are coming out of modern day high school, which I think is what Santa Ana or some, yeah, I don't know where it is. Santa Ana. In fact, the quarterback for Alabama, who won the Heisman, is a modern-day graduate. Uh, the quarterback for Clemson is a modern-day graduate. Previous quarterback for Georgia was a modern-day graduate. What, what, what is there about modern day that is churning out such fabulous athletes? Do they just offer these phenomenal scholarships around to, to kids to come in? Does anybody, anyone have an insight? Johnny, you live out there, don't you? I, I do, and my guess is that their success and their style of coaching has made it a magnet, and parents who want the best for their kids recognize the, the beautiful history and structure. So I'm guessing a big part of it is that, that they're attracting talent. I know John Bosco does too. John, John Bosco has a large number of very talented SC, SEC football players from Bosco. Now, I'm now sure the there are net, I'm sure yeah, there are networks. There are networks among the coaches. Where, okay. Well, yeah, just didn't part know. of it is the recruiting rules. Uh, Unlike public schools, they're not restricted and they're recruiting to any particular geographical area. Okay. So, you know, the, 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 the sky's the limit. Well, they must, point, they, must put, they must put enormous money, modern day, they must put enormous amounts of money into their athletic program then. It has to be. They do. Okay. It's a, it's a great, great. They do, but you know, there have also been in the news about yeah the this lawsuit about uh, uh, kids being injured and not cared <clears throat> for and, and hazing and that sort of thing. But uh, I guess I'm just curious. I guess perhaps the emphasis on jocks uh, has its shadow side too. Oh, indeed. Yeah, there's a school in Northern California, too, a De La Salle High School, which sometimes makes it to the championship. It's a smaller school, but they they have a similar profile here up north. And, uh, and their coaching staff, you know, when you watch the game, you could, it looks like the same as a college staff. You know, it's just not one coach. It's just, there's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of coaches, you know, for defense and offense and all that type of thing. It, it's a big thing up here too. I'm De La just Salle. wondering, so. I hadn't thought about it before, but those schools get bigger television coverage. And I'll bet there are TV rights that go into that athletic budget. And so, there are televised high school games? Oh, all over the oh, place, yeah. Oh, okay, didn't know that, okay. Well, thanks for the information. Kind of trivial in light of everything else that's going on, but I so was here's just curious. An, yeah, here's another thing I'd like to do. I have my iPhone all set up to send an invitation to Bob Bonneau and Francis Daly, Frank Daly, to join the group either next Friday or thereafter. So I have all of you copied on it. Should I go ahead and send it? Well, let me ask you this. Talk to, yeah. I think it's great. Were you going to invite both of them at the same time or one, one individually by themselves? Uh, it was to both of them together. Yeah, to both come at the same time. Do you think that's the best way to do it? George? 
Uh, I don't, yeah, to me, it seems like a good, a good match. Uh, Bob Bonneau is, I haven't read his book. Tom, have you read anything? Has anybody read any of his book? About... I, I haven't, I haven't yet read the book on the priesthood. Yeah. Where he has some rather radical proposals, but he, uh, his other one on the name of God. Uh, I find, I'm not sure I agree with him, but I think he's, he's aiming to start a discussion or conversation. I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to happen, but basically what he wants <clears throat> is that we, um, in all of our liturgy and theology, rename God going back to the um, the burning bush name for God, uh, Yahweh, but that we uh, shorten it to its root, which is Yah, for God the Father. And then God the Son would be um, Yad, Y A H D, for the Hebrew word dab, Dabar, I think it is, uh, meaning word. And then the spirit rename, uh, oh, what's the Hebrew word for breath? Um, Ruah. Ruah. So, so Ruah. Yar. Y-A-H-R, Yar, or Ruah, God the Ruah. And, you know, what he is, you know, proposing is that this would transcend the, um, the, the, the cultural distinctions and the uh, gender uh, problem of the nomenclature and all of that. And he... He kind of downplays the mm. fact that good Jews do not pronounce the name by saying that that originated in an institutional Judaism, that it was part of their control mechanism to, uh, to not pronounce the name of God and then to substitute it for Lord, which has governance and military uh, implications. And so that, if I'm understanding him correctly, that's an oversimplification of the point I think he was trying to make. But, you know, again, he does it in a very interesting way in that book. I, I'm sure I'll hang on every word, but my immediate knee jerk, admittedly knee jerk reaction is if it's not broken, don't fix it, Father. I mean, uh, who cares? Well, he's I mean, about Hebrew roots, and uh, I mean, why does that matter? Well, no, he's he's claiming that our current terminology is broken because it is so heavily masculine. Uh, uh, so that that's basically his claim. And, well, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll enlist in his yeah. army after I hear him. Who yeah. knows? But. I don't know. Uh, I don't think it'll go with millennials. The new terminology. I don't know. I don't think you know. I I, I don't think it's going to get any traction. But it's yeah. kind of an interesting. You know, if you've got to get something out there to get some kind of a a um, to 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 get some kind of a dialogue going. Otherwise, we also do risk impoverishing our language down to the safe and political, politically correct. And, uh, you know, and that's, and, and that, 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 that's a war that is going on too. Yeah, there's I, a... I, I think he would, he would say, hey, it is broken, it needs to be fixed, and here's a proposal for how, how we might think about fixing it. I can't well, say that I agree with him. Fascinating. But it's a rather, uh, uh, well, he's a very creative thinker anyway. 
uh, yeah, there's a devotion among at least certain Protestants to the, uh, meditating upon the names of God from the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Somebody gave me a book on it, but I lost it. But there are a lot of titles, um, yeah. you know, from I am uh, who I am to uh, sounds like Popeye to me, but nevertheless, I, I am who I am. Or, but um, yeah. uh, okay, God on spinach. Huh? God on spinach. Yeah. That, I'm like George you, is. Uh, my, my pastor called us together for a holy hour for Ukraine on uh, Ash Wednesday and ended with the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, which, um, uh, and I know that's one of your favorite devotions. You're referring to blessed be God, blessed be his holy name. You know, I'm yeah, fine with divine, that. Well, I, I was thinking of the divine praises, but then I watched yeah. this. But, uh, but you know, I, I, I'm, I'm fine with it, but I think we need to keep it in proportion with its source and origin, which is the, uh, you know, the, the Eucharistic celebration. Yeah, I, this first time I've been to benediction of the Blessed Sacrament in years, mm -hmm. but I've always liked it. Mm -hmm. and so what did we Growing decide up. about George's Ferrick's invitation? Did, did yeah, we let's go get, ahead? Oh, let's do it. Yeah. There, there's, yeah. A, there, there's a question that I would have. Are Bob and Frank in regular communication with each other? Uh, Frank communicated. Frank made a response to Bob Bonneau's email. And uh, and I think the thought that was in my mind is that Bob Bonneau has gone around and visited priests in many areas of the United States right. for that association that you belong to, Tom. Mm -hmm. And I visited Bob when he was out here visiting. Uh, he went to Marin County and then he may have, I, I can't remember if Gary met him or, uh, but Bob was going up north and either he, met some people up in Santa Rosa or not, but uh, he was heading north. Mm -hmm. And Frank, Frank's experience is being a priest, having left, married, his wife died, and coming back into the priesthood. That's right. So I think he might have some interesting, so, so I thought both of them would be able to give a, what do you call it, uh, multifaceted look at things. Frank, coming back after being out, you know, I think myself, I thought, gee, what, what would I say differently if I were a priest again, having experienced some of family life and being uh, in the other side of the pulpit uh, mm -hmm. type of thing. So, so I, I, I think both of them might be a good duo, you know, kind of like a play off of each other and so forth and uh, have Frank could listen to Bob too and give him responses and vice versa. But they're classmates. We're all all three of us are classmates. We're one one class behind Fred. Yeah. Now well, I George, know that George, so they're contemporaries. Right. So they're so they're kind of contemporaries of Tom and Gary too. They're in the same cohort. Right. Of nineteen sixty eight. Yeah. Now uh, the the reason for my question is I think that if they are already um, how would I say, friends with each other and in regular conversation with each other, that would affect the dynamic with us a great deal. Because, uh, you know, we would be, um, how do I want to put it? You know, we, we want to invite them into a conversation, a friendly conversation, rather than to make this an interview. I would think. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, but are, however, are they both friends out. of yours? I mean, have no. you been in touch with both of them? Uh, no, over the not, not, not frequently. Nope. Oh. I've, I've, I, I've been Joe Martos, right. whom you may I mean, know, it, it, used to send out 
an email to all of our class about, in quotes, Catholic news and different okay. things. And so, so I would get these emails uh, and so forth. But uh, I have not been in any particular contact with either one of them. Okay. Well, it sounds like they're each going to be interesting yeah. and how much they have in common uh, to me is kind of irrelevant. I mean, in the worst case, each, one of them will sit there and listen respectfully to some strange material the same way we will. Yeah. Um, and yeah. what's that hurt? You know, and then the, mm -hmm. uh, the other one waxes uh, eloquent. Uh, the other one listed. I'll bet it takes two it, sessions. It could, yeah, it could. We could start with the one session, see how it goes, and then maybe have another session. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Well, the other question, well, of course, is be, could they both be available at the same time? You know. I know we don't even know. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't even know if they yeah. want to do this. So it's just yeah. kind of putting it out there. Yeah. As a first step, which I've. I'm I'm all for it. You know, I, I was I too. asking my questions as, as a, you know, point of information rather than introducing an objection. But I'm all for it. I thought that would be great. Okay, sure. Well, I'll just. Everybody is everybody else? okay? Yeah. I've got the email, yeah. and I'm going to copy you in the email, and I'll send it. How's that? Yep. That's fine. That sounds good. Sure. Here goes. Yeah, George, you be the ringmaster or MC or whatever. Yeah, I'm glad to do that. Yeah, I've done it in my work. I've been on panels of mediators, you know, and kind of been the facilitator of discussion, that type of thing. So and I, I also was a chairman it. of a jury, <laughs> ah, a chairperson okay. of a jury, and I made sure everybody got their two bits in. That was my job. I've been reading about this. Um, <laughs> Also, George, if you would uh, okay. ask them to copy all on their reply so that we all get it. Okay, or else I'll, yeah, if they don't do that, I'll, I'll do it myself. How's that? Because yeah. I just okay. sent it out. I just sent the email out and you see what I said. So, okay. Okay. I just wanted to cross the Rubicon on that one and kind of get it going. That sounds good. You know, just before we started, I got one of these little news squiggles from somebody, either CNN or the Wall Street Journal, and it said, uh, uh, there's now no doubt but that the Russians are using cluster bombs profusely yeah. in, in Ukraine. Yeah, uh, that's uh, <clears throat> well, and they also are those the ones that they, they they uh, they kind of explode and they spew flammable liquid into the air, and uh, so that anybody caught in it will will be uh, burned. Is that the idea? Well, that's a different thing. They're that's a different one. Yeah. Okay. Thermal yeah. Barrett or th thermal. But, but, oh yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah, it sounds it, all of it sounds pretty terrible. It yeah, sounds like uh, on the second one, if you're anywhere near it, it uh, creates a vacuum and sucks the air out of your lungs, which yeah. can't be a pleasant experience. No. Oh. Yesterday, I I was on a New York Times um, site, and it says uh, if you'd like to hear the very latest, um, you can do it right here. So I did. And there was about a paragraph of a report from, I don't know, I, I got to about 20 people and I stopped. But each one was just um, almost breathtaking in its ugliness. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't sleep very well. Yeah. And it, you know, just this whole thing of, uh, attacking the nuclear reactor oh, yeah. is terrible too. And the, the whole thing of trying to turn off power so people don't have heat. And uh, it just seems, you know, I don't know how we could ever have in quotes, a normal war again, because of 
Russia and its arms. What are we going to do if we're ever in conflict with Russia? Will we both agree not to use nuclear arms or will it be an all out thing? It just seems totally terrible. I don't think anybody trust the other not to use nuclear arms. I don't know that anybody would agree to that. Thinking that they they pull back and then the other guy wouldn't and etc. Well, once it started, but yep. um, yeah. So what if uh, Russia violates the NATO boundaries, and would that precipitate us into something that would end up being nuclear? It I almost seems that way. Yeah. It almost seems like the unthinkable could happen. For Estonia. Yeah. Well, who, who knows? Yeah. You know, they could very well lay claim to just about any of those states that were in the former Soviet Union. Yeah, they could. And very clearly, Putin is not Gorbachev, who was convinced, I think, about the real politics of he did not want to be the guy who destroyed the world or his country or anything like that. No, I think Putin is acting like a he's batshit crazy. Yeah. yeah. Just crazy, yeah. just crazy. And, and, and so what I know is going on is I know that there's a lot of effort at back channel communication between Millie, who is the chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense to try and have at least the most senior military officials in Russia and, and them to have a method of rapid instantaneous communication. And they had had that, except in the last month, Putin has pretty much stopped that back channel conversation from occurring. And that is what is troublesome is, um, I mean, for example, 1985, um, Russia had it on extremely, we and Russia had it on extremely good authority that Russia, Soviet Union had launched an, an ABM against the United States. And it turns out to have been a, tech, a technology fault. But the fact that senior senior guys at NORAD could pick up the phone and call these guys in the Soviet Union. And they said, no, 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 we, we can guarantee you. No, no, no. And so we stood down. But now that Putin has cut off that back channel communication between our joint chiefs and his, um, I think it's, it's scarier than it. It's scarier. It's really scary. Yeah. Do any of you have the same feeling that you're talking about, Tim, because uh, I, I, I think having experienced Trump and through the four years of his presidency, when they were military people on his staff, that seemed to be checks and balances. You know, yeah. they said, you know, they were the adults in the room and how he pared them down and got rid of them and put in people who were real idiots, you know, and cronies and not even competent uh, and look what he did, you know, and he, if he had four more years, let's say his uh, rule had been extended, just, uh, just terrible. So I can kind of apply that to Putin triply, triple fold or something like that. You know, if, if he's doing that and he's got much more power than Trump had because we weren't yeah. a dictatorship, things are in bad shape. If there's, if that, yeah. Back, yeah. back channel is is not there. You know, this is really, I, th I think the world has to deal with what, what do you do if you get some crazy guy in there or somebody who becomes crazy like this, you know, it just seems like yeah. a, a tragedy of the ultimate degree. Yeah. Yeah, another uh, interesting, scary possible scenario yeah, what if Trump actually had been elected and if Trump were now the president, we would see him, I'm sure, siding with Putin. We would not have any kind of strain or fear of Russia doing violence against us because we would be siding uh, 
U.S. leadership would be siding with, uh, with, with, with Putin. Now, that could give rise to a civil war here in the United States. Well, but uh, supposedly the Republican shtick on this is Putin never would have dared attempt this had Trump been in office still. That's true, George. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. how uh, how come how do, you know you know what's the because, it, because we showed our weakness in, in the in the withdrawal from Afghanistan. We showed that we are weak and unwilling to stick it out. And now, of course, I, and so some friends of mine were making that argument yesterday in my Perseo group, and I said, "Who the hell can say?" what Putin's impressions are of Biden versus Trump. And so for the Republicans to be asserting that Putin sees the U.S. as weak because it's Biden, I said, yeah, that's just, you, you got no basis for that. And, uh, yeah, I agree well, with you, it, Republican. It, it, Trump, I read some comments. Trump uh, always fond over Putin. Yeah, well, I, the, the fact is that whether there was collusion as such, the Russians were sure as hell trying to get Trump in office uh -huh. uh, in 2016. Um, and that, that's got to be because they figured he's crazier than shit and easily manipulable and flatterable and, and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. And 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 uh, Biden ha hasn't uh, you know uh, kept from faux pas. I mean, he said uh, you know he didn't say one foot in Ukraine and, and you've had it. He said, well, if they take a little bit, uh, you know, uh, might not be so bad. <laughs> so what, mean, what does that say? <laughs> Maybe that's good that he said that. I uh, yeah, I I, I I go back and forth about that. <laughs> but Tim, to get back to you know people that talk about Afghanistan, Trump is a guy that 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 took us out of there and actually set the date when we were supposed to be out. Yeah, I know. Right, and he didn't even include the Afghan people in that. You know, he's a guy that set that up. But so what? And then the but Republicans it, blasted. The supporters uh, don't want to know the facts that they, they, you know, they, whatever story he comes out with, they're going to believe it. You look I at that know. CPAC conference last week in Florida. God, it reminded me of the Nuremberg rallies, you know. Yeah. Just, oh, well. We're in bad shape. Yeah. Who was it? So I have, I have a question. Is there anybody within the Democratic Party that you think would have the style and the conviction to step up and change that perception of the of the Democrats as soft? We've got a weak bench. Yeah, I, I don't see that there's anybody. Uh, I thought Manchin maybe, but nah. No. Um, no, I don't know. Uh, uh, why now? I mean, he stood up to the whole progressive wing of the Democratic Party yeah, without yeah. blinking. Well, that's why I, I think and, about and, it. Including the president of the United States. For but he's also, he's also got to have an image um, that he's half crazy. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, Trump had the image that he was half crazy. And, and uh, no, you know, four fifths. You, you, you know, you. <laughs> Come after me and I'll blow your heads off. And who in the Democratic Party has that? I've always liked Sherrod Brown. Yeah. 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 Yeah, he's good. He's an old fashioned Democrat, you know? Yeah. And labor yeah. union and all that. How about Senator Whitehouse? Crazier shit, George. Is no. he? Is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it militant. No, he was the Supreme Court. Um, Excuse uh, me. Uh, it, too far gone. I I think. Um, I like Angus King. I don't know much about him, but he's got a great face. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, he's good. He's he's kind of bipartisan in a sense. Yeah. Tries to be. Yeah. And what we're what we're all saying is the bench is pretty thin. It is awfully thin. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, the, and the Republican so, and Republicans bench is deep, deep, deep. I mean, really deep. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that I would vote for any of them, but I'm just saying there's a lot. There are a number of nationally known figures in the Republican Party that, um, you know, whereas that I think have degrees of support regionally. But, but you know, I think the Democrats have shot themselves in the foot for the last decade. But that's just my own opinion. No, it's not. I don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah. It's a lot yeah. of disagree. Yeah. I mean, I think the guy sad that, times. The, the Republican guy that I think is pretty interesting huh. is the guy from Missouri. Um, Holly, Josh Holly. Holly. Yeah. H A W L E Y. Smarter yeah. than a whip. Yep. Apparently, completely unscrupulous. Yes, he is. And he's so right wing. Gosh, yeah. But you um, know, it's it, you know, I, I, it's easy for these prognosticators to say, okay, this is what's going to happen this November. But three or four months ago, no one saw Ukraine on the horizon as as, as going to be an issue, and so. Who knows what will happen over the next several months that will divert or, or get the attention of the voting public? I mean, maybe, maybe Biden and his efforts with NATO will instill in Americans, you know, this is the right approach to take rather than Trump's destroying NATO. And, and so I maybe I am a naive optimist, but I just have to remain optimistic that events could take over. You know what happens here? No, I mean I don't, that's that's trivial. I mean events that are occurring in Europe may make the public need to support different kinds of candidates than right wing Republicans. I don't know. That's my hope. Hope of springs eternal. Yeah, well, I mean, look at the way NATO is stepping up. You know, Trump made such a huge deal out of, uh, especially Germany, not paying its 2% of GNP, uh, uh, et cetera. And here's this very lefty premier of Germany who becomes incensed um, and says, that we're going to have to increase our GNP contribution to NATO and, you know, get tough and exactly what Trump was uh, excoriating them for not doing. Now yeah. they are. So yeah. it would seem to me that that takes away an issue from Trump, at least, one hopes. Uh, you know, let me toss this out here. Here's something I felt and see if it reverberates. Uh, Ned, you said you had trouble sleeping. Yeah. And it seems like before you came train, you know, you know, Tim, you said it, it wasn't on the horizon. What were we concerned about for two years about saving lives? Every night there was a COVID report, right? How many, 2 million people, uh, 500,000 in the United States, 600,000 doctors and nurses working in over, overextended hospitals to keep people alive. So there's that monster, big effort to keep people alive worldwide. And now there are other humans killing each, killing other humans, trying to get rid of other humans. And I think it's just jarring to the psyche. I don't know, I just feel like that's, it's totally jarring to the psyche that here we were trying to fight the virus universally. And now there are other people who are killing their brothers, you know, the Ukraine, Russian soldiers yeah, that, killing that. That, you know that's that's um, that's hard to fathom. Cognitive dissonance. Oh. Yeah, it's really. Yeah. Mm. Does, does anybody? Can you hear me? Okay, because I'm getting mm -hmm. kind of a 
bad connection. Can you hear me? You're, you're frozen. Yes. Right. Thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. You're frozen, but uh, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, you, you know, know the what? juxtaposition is you were talking about, George. The juxtaposition of the, that that huge effort uh, for two plus years, and now this, and then I think about about the Chinese talking to Putin and saying, hey, 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 don't start anything. You know, we know what you're doing. Don't do it until the Olympics are over. Uh, you know, this, 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 this cold management of, of this, this slaughter, it, it, it's crazy. Uh, it is, know, yeah. The, the Ukrainians know they're gonna get crushed like a, you know, like a bug unless you know, people start, I mean, nations start uh, sending effective weapons and perhaps, um, uh, you know, uh, counselors uh, who happen to be in soldier uniform and, and have arms uh, with them. Uh, yeah, but how will the weapons even get through? You know, there, there's no planes flying in. There's no, there won't be any highways clear. Yeah. You know, if these cities are surrounded, the weapons can't even get there no matter how many Germany wants to give and yeah, the training. They almost blocked the uh, yeah. Black Sea now, apparently. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a real, uh, you know, this, what do you call that thing? You, Mexican uh, boogies that, that just. Oh you yeah, know. right, you put your two feet. <laughs> Alvera Street. <laughs> yeah. I, used to, <laughs> I used to use those uh, during mediation. <laughs> To show how kids what? felt <laughs> between warring parents. Yeah. Kids fighting with parents. You know, those little things made out of straw, that, those tubes where you put your fingers in each end and then yeah. you pull apart. Yeah. And they just get tighter. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary. Really scary. And so, what are you guys doing for Lent? That's what, a good what, 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 what kind of practices do you guys use? If, if anything different. Well, my, my usual is, and, and this is quite standard, um, that I'm giving up alcohol. So no evening martinis or um, Negronis or, or wine. So that's... Uh, that, that 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 is kind of my standard. The the other thing is, um, I you know I'm I'm just trying to be more attentive to the normal stuff as part of my uh, my own sort of I don't. Know, need to come out of myself. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what that means, but try to, you know, enter with greater gratitude into all of the circumstances of my life. And gratitude, I think, is one of the one of the key things that I've been thinking about in this in this, you know, as we get into Lent. Do you I'm feel I'm in a pretty right? similar I'm in a pretty similar place as Tom, giving up the hard stuff, trying to be more disciplined. And I would say much more interested in networking, expressing my care and love for family members and friends. And uh, I've been going through my, my uh, address book and reaching out to folks that it's been a while. Uh, you'll recognize a name, George Moret. Hadn't mm -hmm. talked to him since maybe a year ago. And I gave him a call and he was thrilled just to have that connection. So I think um, I'm gonna try to do more of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have given uh, talks recently, not recently, 
relatively recently on prayer. And um, it always leads me to a point that I haven't really crossed uh, effectively um, in the last several, I don't know, long time years. And that is um, meditation, being quiet, trying to listen. And <laughs> I can't get myself to do a holy hour, but um, are you guys, yeah, you're frozen. No, you're not. No, oh, we're okay. So I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to uh, put together a, uh, a quiet half hour a day and reading some meditations uh, afterwards or before the uh, before, I'm sorry, um, of John Henry Newman's. He's quite good. He's, you know, it's a little archaic the way he writes, but uh, that was back in the 1850s. It's still. It's still, it's wonderful, yeah. So, and, and also, uh, George and I read a book together, or not together, but we found it, I think, together, uh, that a woman wrote, and she called it um, um, the, the, uh, the practice of less. And rather than giving up stuff, um, she talks about uh, uh, being less uh, being in the moment about about not being so aggressive <laughs> uh, in our lives, and um, uh, I'm trying to do that too. I, it sounds like like you, Tom. I you know it's hard to explain, but but it's really different. Um, so being quiet, listening, meditating. You know, one thing that I'm trying to do is. Uh, I am this experience last yeah. night. And so mine, mine is. Um, now this this will shock you. Um, out. Can, can you okay still? No, I'm frozen. I'm frozen. Yeah. We so, hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. And so and and, and I, I'm I'm very quick to judge, and I think that that's been. Oh, you know. Um, on an introspective level, which I try to do, is I'm very much aware of how easy it is for me to become judgmental. And whether or not that's politics or how someone views the church. And so I was thinking that if I could adopt the attitude, if I could work towards getting the attitude of thinking that the first thing I should think of is people are trying to be good. In other words, make an assumption, which is not always gonna work out, that people are searching for the good. And I was thinking about my neighbors who are part of the Rad Trad Catholic group. Um, and, and that I have just really, uh, and they are wonderful neighbors in every sense, but you know, they're just off the wall. And I thought, okay, maybe my attitude if I could change my attitude that what they're searching for in their own way is a, in, in their journey towards heaven, if they're searching for a way to do that, that differs from mine, but they're doing it authentically, they're doing it um, wholeheartedly, then Maybe if I started thinking that way, whether or not it comes to the church or politics or whatever is going on, maybe I could become more forgiving more. And if I can become more forgiving <clears throat> I, or understanding, um, maybe I would see that I'm sure people look at me and say, oh, that I'm rigid. I'm too outspoken. I can be a jerk. And so... That's, this is a hard thing for me to, to think that, that other people are motivated by good intentions when I think the world is surrounded by people who are obviously, like Putin, not motivated by good intentions, not trying to find the truth. But with my personal interactions with either guys in my Curcio group or neighbors or friends in church or wherever it is, 
where I know, where I hope, or I know them well enough to know that they're essentially good people. But, you know, I can't stand their politics or I can't stand their view. It's just to try to back away and try not become judgmental and just say, look, you're searching for the truth. You're looking, you're look, you're on this journey with me and um, doesn't do me any good to be judgmental. Now, that may not make any sense to you guys. It may not make any sense, but it, I'm going to work on just back off on my judgments so quickly, you know. That makes a lot of sense. It's a struggle. It's a struggle, I'm telling you. Uh, Tim, do these people see you as judgmental? I think I think they see me as rigid. Um, Like we were having a conversation last night at dinner after Curcio, and one guy was saying, he said, I think we should be willing to annihilate the earth with nuclear war to stop Putin. And wait, I, wait, I lost wait. it. Oh, wait, uh, Tim, Tim, hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second. The last words we heard were we should be willing to annihilate the earth. And then uh, some divine intervention or yeah. something garbled yeah. what you were saying. So we didn't actually yeah. hear that complete thought. Thanks, Tom. That's good. Could you repeat well, that? Could you, could you replay it a little bit? Well, it comes up, it can hear me still. We can and hear I you. I said to. I said you're just a fucking asshole to think oh, okay. that way. But, but, <laughs> but how what did you way? think? That's what we didn't catch. Now, what did the person say? <laughs> what did the person say? We should be willing to annihilate the earth, too, and that then is. you cut out. And because I want under, we've got a bad connection again. So, could you repeat yeah. what the guy said that pissed you off? That he said we should be willing to take on Russia in spite of a nuclear war threat because it's more, it would be morally good to destroy Putin and that he is willing to die, you know, in a nuclear war. And I said, you're just a fucking asshole to think that way. I said, you're making, you can't make a decision for the world, you know, because you have this attitude. And he said, no, he said, I think that we should stand up for the moral thing, which is, to eliminate Putin. And, and, and so I didn't even want to know how he got to that point. And that's where my judgmentalness, I, I had no interest at all in Brian's logic as to how he got to that perspective. And Tim, that's what, what was, I do. What, what was the clause or sentence in which he used the word annihilate? We should be willing well, to annihilate the whole world in order to accomplish what? Get rid of Putin. He that he was willing to he was willing to risk nuclear nuclear holocaust to show how moral how immoral Putin was, and I and it just was like oh, and so it was it was just a, a bizarre exchange that. I didn't, as I said, I just I didn't even want to know how he got to that conclusion. I mean, it's just so crazy. It's pretty uh, stupid. Yeah, but he said, "Look, he said I'm ready." To, he said, "I'm ready to die." He said, "I think dying in a nuclear hole." I mean, so so it's hard for me when I've got friends like this <laughs> who are. Uh, yeah, I've gone off the wall. It, it's hard not to become judgmental. You know, that's that's that's. So this is my struggle. It really yeah. is my struggle. But we've all got friends like that. About, about 40, 50 years ago, I read an article uh, that uh, was written by a very, very conservative Catholic saying that the reason that we are more able to stand uh, on our principles is because we know that we're going to die and go to heaven. And uh, those who don't believe in the afterlife or are, are not religious uh, are afraid of dying because um, that's the end. And, and so uh, it, it sounds to me like that logic is, is somewhere hidden in this guy's mind. You know, we're going to heaven anyway, so let's just kill ourselves. Yeah, but he's willing to have children in yeah, I, Patagonia so, yeah, die. Crazy. So, to protect 
No, not to protect anybody, just to beat Putin back. I mean, to kill Putin, he's willing to let all the children of the earth die. Yes. Um, uh, pregnant women, um, et cetera. He's an idiot. <laughs> Well, uh, he, I, no, Tim was right. He's a fucking idiot. Yeah, and I, I concur with your judgment, Tim. Well, no, wait a minute. There's yeah. a distinction what between an idiot and an asshole. <laughs> what kind of logic well, is that? I mean, well, tens, uh, hundreds of millions of innocent people should die to, you know, kick Putin's ass? That's absurd. Tim, I think you should get that guy's phone number and give it to George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm coming back there, Tim. <laughs> You're welcome to come back. You're welcome. <laughs> but but you know, how old is this guy and is he a bachelor or you know, you know, what oh, if no, he's no. a what if he's a 90-year-old alcoholic <laughs> yeah. single bachelor with no kids and no yeah. grandkids? I could see somebody <laughs> saying that, you know. No, he's 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 sixty two and he's got five kids and twelve grandkids and uh, oh my god yeah. well maybe that's a crack to try to understand you know say hey hey Joe look at that you got five kids you got twelve grandkids uh, how could you say such a thing do you think that might be an but, entree yeah yeah and and, and uh, so not to belabor Brian it's it's, it is, he like, it was, is he a Curcio guy? Is he a Curcio graduate? Oh, oh boy. Oh, yeah, he, he's the head of Curcio for the state. Yes. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, my. Matt, that, that's what we were talking about before we started. Christians yeah. that just don't buy any of it. Yeah. Well, oh on a point, at one point that they would make, and I'm sure that he does, uh, under, um, how would I say, under a contemporary secularistic regime in the West, we are already killing hundreds of millions of innocent children through abortion. I mean, I'm sure that that's, that's a point that he would, he would introduce very quickly uh, as a counter argument to George Crooks. Um, Killing the babies in uh, Patagonia, <clears throat> maybe. Oh. But and, so. and I think that would probably produce an impasse. You know, one of the things that I keep thinking has it ever? I mean, we've we've got the weapons and the means to do this, but has it ever been different in any of the major conflicts that have taken place in our entire world? I'm thinking. You know, and George Crook, you, you're familiar with this because you've read into it. Uh, in the Byzantine Empire, probably the greatest of them, of the emperors, was Justinian. But he got his, basically got his start. He was going to flee the country because the Hippodrome in Constantinople mm -hmm. was filled with his, uh, his opponents. And his wife told him, be a man. And he turned around and slaughtered 20,000 of them instantly in, in the right in front of the Hagia Sophia in, uh, in, in uh, uh, well, the, I think the, the, first, the first Hagia Sophia, I think, was destroyed, or the second one was destroyed in that revolt. But uh, uh, well, know, and he rebuilt it, but you know, it was at, well. The problem after, is that after you know, killing twenty thousand people in absolute cold blood. Except he probably didn't kill one of them, and I think that's a problem. You know, Putin can not. You know, if you gave him a sword in a room with two little children and you said, "Putin could go ahead and kill these children," maybe he would. You know, but if he, but if he wouldn't, but it's it's so easy to send other people out to do the killing. You know, yeah. you can press a button or make a phone call, you know, and and then it's the general sending the word out to the grunts. And then you got the 17 year old kid out there or somebody in front of a button, you know, or in an yeah. airplane. But, but he was right there witnessing the slaughter. Oh, sure. Sure. But, uh, you know, I mean, but, it wasn't it wasn't something done in a in a remote bunker. Uh, 
No, he, I don't think he was a warrior ask, himself. What do you think? Be content if Tim, Tim, you're breaking up. Criminal justice. Tim, you're breaking up a bit. There's nothing at all that Sorry. I can out of here. What is this doing? Yeah, I'm just. I don't. Tim, do you have other members of your family playing computer games on the internet while you're uh, taking? No. Your is it just me, with? or are you, are you guys finding that you're timing out as well as I am? No. Mm. It's got to be me. It's got to be my internet provider then. Okay. Maybe yeah, now you're hacked. Yeah, but now you're okay. Yeah. But then we're the other hacked. times you're not. Take advantage of being hacked. Yeah, it's, it's the Russians who are interfering with you. Um, but you Absolutely. know, none of us, none of us here is a vet. And uh, I've never had a gun in my hands and had to shoot somebody, such yeah. as my brother in Vietnam may have done. Uh, John, you know, and, and, and there's something, you know, PTSD, you know, having to actually be eyeball to eyeball or like at the, even at the end of the world war, wasn't there some craziness with soldiers, even after the war was over with oh, kind yeah. of about a German meeting an American and did they put their arms down? Maybe they did, or did they just still try to shoot each other? Or, or I don't know, but uh, you know, there's something that I think would stay with the person, you know, the amount of PTSD that's going to exist after this war is going to be humongous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, on the Russian side and on the Ukrainian side, even defending yourself, they're going to have to be killing people willy nilly, you know, and just, uh, it's just uh, something that it's hard to imagine. And yet the people that order it are miles away from it. They're, they, they are safe, you know, you know, we've actually gone through this before with the Cuban Missile Crisis yep. and uh, a lot more close to the edge than we are now. And uh, uh, I mean, JFK had a few vices, um, but he was also a extremely civilized man. And uh, he... Um, uh, famously said during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, people say they'd be better read than dead, better to be read than dead. I don't want my children to be better read than dead. Uh, I would rather they'd be alive and read than read and dead. About his own kids, you know. Now, if, if that had got out, can you imagine? Um, uh, but he... Um, at the beginning of the Cuban Missile Crisis was just horrified when Dean Acheson and um, I mean, Dean the Russell. Joint Chiefs uh, came in and said, well, let's attack, you know, let's, let's attack the, 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 the missiles in Cuba. Well, gee, won't that start World War III? Yeah, but we'll win it, you know, if, if we do it this year. And, um, you know, and, and uh, then I guess it was, was it Bobby? I don't remember. They came up with the blockade idea. Remember that? And, yeah. and the notion of a blockade is what saved all of our lives. Mm -hmm. And it could have gone the other way, just with a flip of a coin, if, if somebody else had been, pre excuse me, president. And then uh, paying attention to one message that was yeah. sent. As a yeah, that, that was brilliant yeah. ploy of Bobby's. You yeah. know, yeah. answer the first Which, letter, not the second one. Just ignore yeah. the second one for Khrushchev. George, that reminds me of what I was thinking as a military strategy, and that is cutting supply lines to all or as many of the Russian invaders as we could. Now, there well, are supply lines close to home, though. I mean, in Cuba, we had the advantage. Our supply lines were very short, and the Russians extended across the whole globe. You know, from Russia to Cuba. Yeah. And now we, we, the Russians would have that advantage. 
But according yeah. to this morning's paper, I mean, this is just un this is mind boggling. Uh, uh, Miley, no, not Miley. Oh, some well-known four-star general now retired said this Russian convoy, the famous 40 mile convoy yeah, is, is snared. Uh, they can't get loose. They, he said, they're sitting there parked three tanks abreast for 40 miles. Well, what do you do? You know, if, if you're a uh, tank at 18 miles, where can you go? What could you do? Nothing. And so uh, he, he said, it's just, they have fucked this up so big time, apparently. I mean, thank God. Um, I, the, 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 I mean, they're having success in the South down by the Black Sea. But the 40 mile convoy is just sort of sitting there outside of Kim. Um, and and the, yeah. By the way, my maternal ancestors come from that Black Sea region near about, I don't know, 30 miles, 40 miles up from Odessa. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, yeah. Uh, they, they, and, and of course they were German, they're German Russians. All right. They were imported there from, uh, you know, by Catherine the Great, when nobody questioned that Ukraine was part of, part of Russia. And uh, you know, she wanted economic development there, so she imported a whole bunch of uh, uh, German farmers. And then uh, how, how did that family then eventually get to South Dakota. There was a big migration uh, right around the turn of the century from of German Russians into the Midwest. Wow. In North, North and South Dakota, Nebraska in particular. Now were they Roman Catholics or Unions? Uh, they were Roman Catholics, uh, a very large Lutheran population too. So they sure. were either Lutherans or, and of course they settled in religious, uh, religious colonies but uh, uh, and and there's been a I mean there, there are two societies based in uh, and I belong to both of them in uh, uh, the Dakotas on uh, of, of German Russians uh, who are in America and they've done a whole bunch of historical research on them it's, uh, it's uh, well now when the Third Reich came barreling through, uh, these German Russians who were still there were recognized as such by the Nazis. I don't, you know, I. Uh, I know not, they were in Poland. Yeah, I'm. I'm not really clear as to what the. Um, uh, how would I say what what the effect of World War II and its and and its conclusion may have been on them. They may have been just a little bit too remote. Yeah, th this is pretty deep into Russia if they're down by Odessa and the Black Sea, you know? And did the Nazis ever get that far? I guess they did. They got yeah, the Sebastopol, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but, but whether, you know, wh whether little country villages were very much affected or not is another question. Equal. Oh. So that, that I really don't know. Had they been in a city, there may have been. Yeah. Have been different. But how but I just can wanted we to explain the apparent ineptitude of the Russians in this war? Yeah. Uh, I mean, at first I thought it was some sort of trick, but, but I mean, here's this 40 mile long column of armor, which is apparently painted itself into a corner. Mm hmm. Even though, if it, you know, and if this were a traditional warfare, the Ukrainian Air Force would go in and get rid of it. But they don't have one to speak of. Yeah, I know. So that's, uh, they don't, but but that's what would happen if there's a convoy that's just sitting there. My area. Yeah, and what about Putin's Air Force? Why? What's the first thing you do? I mean, if you're going to invade somebody, is you strafe the shit out of everything that moves. We've done, you know. They've that's done. what we did at Normandy, and and uh, I, I just like, I like this is too good to be true that the ineptitude of of the 
Soviet or of the Russian forces. Their, their weapons are fairly inaccurate too, apparently. And well, he, I think he has been strafing and bombing. Um, almost yeah, definitely. So, almost yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, they've already destroyed a lot in Kiev, yep. as well as the other cities, at least according to the pictures on the news. Right. Aerial pictures. I don't, I don't know what Putin's exit plan is. I've been trying to figure, I mean, I know that some of the wisdom, the, the, the smarter Breaking up again. Yeah, Tim. You exit, you go, you, you go in, your objectives, your strategic, might be. I'm dead again. Oh, lost the you internet. come back to life. Weird noises. Uh, Tim, maybe yeah, well, it, I, I if, can't see. I, I don't know it, what his exit plan is. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think he had one. I don't, Doesn't the general opinion seem to be that he was expecting a, uh, a quick victory and install a puppet regime? Mm -hmm. Somewhere back at the beginning of this, I think I read that there are three states of Ukraine that are Russian speaking. Is there any chance he was hoping to just get that portion no. as part of his strategy? That was just, that was his, uh, uh, what it, uh, that was just what he was saying in order to get going. I mean, he's he's way on the other side of Ukraine, uh, bombing in Kiev. You know, I guess we yeah. can. Of course, if, yeah. if if you listen to to what Ukrainians are saying, this is not a new war. They have been fighting this war since nineteen or since twenty fourteen. Yeah. And it was in twenty fourteen that that the Russians attacked and and got control. I think of those or at least strong influence in those two states and that they've been fighting there on a low key basis, but nonetheless fighting all the time. That's my understanding. What yeah, think, but they've right? been apparently lightly armed, those Russians, like yeah. militia yeah. members yeah. without yeah. armor. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's but, just bizarre. Well, I think but, the, but the, you know, the Ukrainians think they feel that they've been under attack since 2014. Yeah, yeah, but what does Putin think, you know, in line with what you're saying about the end game, when you shoot the hell out of the whole country and explode their, you know, power supplies and kill grandmothers and children, and how do you expect this people to, uh, to love you? <laughs> you know, how do you expect them to accept whatever puppet regime is there? You know, when such great damage has been done. Well, you kill the ones who don't love you. Yeah, but that's everybody. Uh, well, so why do it to begin with? Why Let's do it to begin with? Why not? Let's say in the next two weeks, he wins. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, what wins, occupies yeah. the country. Hey, cool. Now you have to garrison it for, I mean, how do you, how do you do that? How do you occupy 40 million people that hate your guts? Exactly. And how do you, you know, rebuild the apartments that yeah, have been destroyed for people that, to live in? That's and, the big mistake. Well, among the big mistake Hitler made uh, yeah. was, you know, never retreat. So in 1944, when, uh, he's busy sitting there occupying Norway, uh, you know, up where it is. And I'm not going to withdraw any troops from there to go down and help out in Normandy. No, no. You know, not one step back. Okay. Yeah. Good, good for you, Adolf. Pendejo. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think the, uh, the American generals are thinking? Are they really very uptight? It's, it seemed like if I were them, I'd be very, I don't know. Switching and... <laughs> Yeah. I 
Really, really. Poor Tim, you're not coming through very well. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, this lets you begin a paragraph. Uh, no, it, it blocks you from the beginnings of your paragraph and then sort of kicks in. Tim, maybe you could use your iPhone or you speaking. could get back on. You know, I think I think I'm being hacked. That's what's going on. Well, you know, you're a lot closer to him than we are. Yeah, you're a lot closer than we are. Yeah. I sure wish I could help you. <laughs> this is the worst ever, Tim. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe. Can you move to a different spot? I'm so close to my modem now that um yeah, now, now all of a sudden we can hear you. That's because, yeah, I, I don't know what it is, guys. But it's it's a labor of love. So, But I'm going to say goodbye because this is ridiculous. And you guys have a good weekend. Can you can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah we can hear you, hear you now. Right now. Yeah, so now you can stay, Tim. Don't go. Hey. <laughs> so I, I think Putin has made a big mistake. I, th mm -hmm. I think it will be the end, end of end of his ability to use military threats to convince anybody in Europe to do anything, because I think it's shown that they are very ineffective. But that makes me worried. Will he pull out the nuclear shit? You know, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's the worry. In, in a desperate move, would he say, you know what? He did it last week where the Belarusian government okayed putting Russian nuclear arms in Belarus. And Belarus and the Ukraine in 1994 gave up all of their nuclear weapons. To the Russians. And with the promise to Ukraine by Russia that their sovereignty would be protected and secure. Well, Belarus did the same thing, but now that president has said you can move nuclear weapons into Belarus. That is a game changer. I think if you're NATO, if you're the Baltic states, if you're Poland, you're saying, ooh, it's getting a little bit too close here. Yeah. So there, I think the nuclear thing is, is the scary part. It is. It is. And well, uh, with respect to distance, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, that makes all that much. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know either because those things have long range yeah. capability, don't they? They they I think Ned, you're right, but I think it's the symbolic the sim, the symbolism of it. Well, you know, you've got, yeah. you've got are, are those yeah. nuclear weapons on intercontinental missiles or are they on the short range tactical uh, missiles? That, that both. Yeah, they, they. They're, they're they're both, you know. Well then you got both. then you got submarines too. Yeah. 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 Nuclear weapons, yeah. yeah. And just before the, the start of the war, uh, uh, what is it, uh, a submarine and four or five other uh, vessels of war uh, entered the Black Sea? Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think the, the crux of it is how one person can go and be in a position of making such a horrendous decision seemingly without checks and balances. I think that's the thing that the world has to deal with. And do any Russian generals have any chutzpah or any moral fiber to do something? At least here with Trump, it seemed like some some generals would have backed off and said, wait a minute, I'm not going to do this. You know, this is crazy. Well, but it's but I don't get but I don't know if any Russian military people or anybody has that sense there. So no, I no. think letting one person get that much power, and I think China's done the same thing, 
these people are in for life, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Trump is in for what until 2036, or I don't know what they did to put him in there all these years. And the same thing with the Chinese ruler. That's that just shouldn't be in today's world. That's just a, a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I mean, in the good old days of the Cold War, I mean, the Soviet Union, you know, uh, they it was very much a committee system. Yeah, yeah. The Politburo and, and um, you know, they... hey, hey, Crook, you have Armenian friends. Yes. Which is a NATO country, borders Russia. Uh, I don't think it's a NATO country. Yes, it is. Armenia? I think it is. Well, Romania is, I thought, is Armenia not? Okay, and I stand corrected. Yeah, I, 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 I bet you, you know, 20 bucks is not. Okay, okay. Yeah. Tom, Tom Walvers will fact check. Yeah. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, right I'm in accord, I'm in accord with, with George Crook. I think, uh, I, I no, think not. Not. Romania, okay. is Romania a native? Uh, a native? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, it yeah. is. Oh, wow. My um, son has been deployed there three or four times, actually. Yeah. Oh, what a fascinating country. Betty and I have actually been there. Uh, um, but. Um, uh, well, is it Romania where your friends are or <clears throat> Albania, George? And neither, Al not Albania and not Romania, but Armenia. Armenia, which is over above uh, uh, northeastern Turkey. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. And, and they're here, they just originated there. <clears throat> but now, you know, talking about the, the geopolitical, Armenia right now is kept alive only by Vladimir Putin, who uh -huh. saved it from, um, um, a, 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 what's the name of that country? Uh, uh, ours, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. Yeah. And really? They they were getting and the same drones that the uh, 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 the, 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 the um what do we call these people we like over there the um, the Turks? No, not the, <laughs> we don't like the Turks. Well, maybe some do, but. Um, George, we can only see half your face. <clears throat> well, it's, a it was, it's, it's the better half. <laughs> um, but but uh, uh, Ukraine, I like to uh, uh, Ukraine's been using these uh, drones to a great effect. And they're the same drones from Turkey that the uh, Azeris used to just butcher the Armenians <clears throat> in their war. They were very effective and deadly against yeah. them. No, 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 no. Tim, you better get back to that modem. Well, you know, a, a few weeks ago, we talked about the just war theory, right? Yeah. It seems like, and there's a Geneva Convention, and there's, it seems like there needs to be, you know, the, the hardware has gone far beyond the map, you know, the map is not the territory. Uh, there's that phrase, and it seems like the territory has changed so much with these drones and the way that in Syria hospitals were deliberately bombed, you mm -hmm. know, places that are supposed to be saving people. Well, get rid of them, you know, make it as terrible as possible. That 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 is a whole new. Maybe that's always been what war is. I don't know, but how it's so much worse. It seems like. <clears throat> Like, where is James Bond when we need him, you know? We that up with reminds these. me, if you want to see a good series, check out Riley Ace of Spies. Is that on TV? I think it's on Netflix. Is it? Uh, yeah, it used to be. He was Carol, uh, a big flame of Carol Houseland. Yeah. Heard, as you know. <laughs> right. Uh, he's the proto- prototype to james bond yeah that's what i heard and, yeah is it good he has the most th that show has the most beautiful theme song oh does it okay yeah uh, uh, um ned didn't like it herbert loved it but oh. is it george 
Riley Ace of oh, yeah. Spies. Okay. Well, Rebellion. It's really, it's really good, I think. Now, I haven't seen it in 10 years. But I, I, Rebellion? George uh, recommended it. It's about the Irish um, uprising. Oh, yeah. Betty and I watched that. that that's, uh, I mean, who of us doesn't have a soft spot for the Irish, the Easter Rebellion, you know? in 1916 i mean this this rebellion series starts with that great and then goes forward through the irish troubles and uh the black and tans and uh you know but george it's 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 the same as the uh, metaphor that you um maybe craftily uh, talked about uh you know you the front yard the uh, the squirrels are getting <laughs> eaten by the yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. By the who? Oh, yeah. The crows and the squirrels and the blue jays and the coyotes and the wild oh. turkeys. Yeah. It seems like there is something in all species about, uh, you know, you don't see crows and pigeons flying together or hanging out together. You know, they're all. And so there's something about, you know, they talked about tribalism. There's nothing new about that. But it seems like we're really exhibiting. The worst of it and in this case you know there's uh brian drolet's comment about it's all about real estate yeah. a lot of it is but a lot of it is about values it. it's 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 not just about real estate is it it's it seems like it it can be but but often it's about people that have different values you know you 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 get rid of people that uh, believe differently and people have been doing it over theology for many years and then they stop doing it for that you know let's uh but uh yeah some people say that putin is not doing this just because of real estate i don't know it's it's very complex it's like uh what is this that he's a devout orthodox christian i mean Russia. nobody says he's devout oh, I've read well that. he may say he is yeah well there was a piece of my Loyal, not devout. Yeah, well, there's a businessman in today's news that'll probably pop up. I forget his name. He's a, a court is bringing a case against him for aiding Russia. He was a person who built broadcast, you know, TV stations in Eastern Asia over there uh, because he thought he didn't like LGBT people. So he saw Putin as an ally because he didn't like LGBT people. And he saw him as Putin as a very devout Christian. So he built these TV stations over there in Belarus and Russia and Ukraine uh, that Putin has been using for disinformation. So, so there's a court case against this guy. I think his name is Hendrix or something like that. But, uh, but to me, that's one of the big factors, too, is this, the degree of misinformation that exists and Putin totally kicking out any independent news agency. Absolute, uh, trying to totally control. You remember when planes used to drive over and drop off leaflets yeah. to people in other, <laughs> other countries? Yeah. Uh, the world, to me, and this is another scary thing, is, is such a confusion of voices it's like the tower of babel and and it's uh it, it it it's a terrible thing to feel like the environment that you're in is for whatever reasons uh putting out this this disinformation intentionally telling lies uh and and you don't know What's the truth? What's what's really going on? <laughs> uh, yeah, war of, war of liberation, right? I'm sorry. It's a war of imprisonment. That's what it is. It's not a war of liberation. Well, it's not characterized that way. Well, but uh, Ned, I thank you are a little too open to this what can we possibly know bullshit that comes to you from your elder son no well maybe yeah i wouldn't doubt it 
but but still, I mean, uh, even the New York Times was saying, "God, we can't believe this. We can't believe that." You know, we've we've tried. We can't believe what? I I can't remember what it was talking about, but mm -hmm. but I, I was I was surprised that the that the New York Times was was. Uh, uh, Talking about this misinformation and the difficulty in in uh, in coming to some kind of real understanding of of facts, uh, truth. Is that you, George? That was me. I'm going to email all you guys this once we finish. Oh, could you move your your thing, um, your monitor, so that? To, to your left, yeah. To my left? I'm sorry, right, to your right. Okay. There I am in all my yeah. splendor. <laughs> I, I, I guess Tim said to hell with this. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think he's done. Hmm. It was not unreasonable because we really couldn't understand it. There's got to be some way uh, hmm. Anyway, um, Advent. Advent? I mean, Lent. That's close. <laughs> <laughs> Same color of vestments, you know, what he expects from the layman. <laughs> Good call, um, <laughs> I was in the ballpark. <laughs> oh, there is an opposite end. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm sending. I'm emailing you two more. You know, to to me, uh, this business of Christianity uh, and historical Christianity is very and Putin's own religious adherence is very central to his um, <clears throat> vision of, of Russian imperialism. So, you know, it, it's, it's not a let's be kind and nice to each other sort of, of Christianity. It is a, um, a very, very strong historically based uh, concept of the historical union of quote church and state. I'm sending a couple of others. I have already sent you all some uh, stuff about uh, the Orthodox uh, uh, relationship with Putin and Russia and their response and the varieties of it and, and the whole religious thing. I did encounter two more when I did a search on uh, uh, Putin and orthodoxy. So I'm sending those along with a Wall Street Journal article that I, can, I cannot access because I'm not a subscriber. Uh, I am um, through Apple oh. News and I'll, once I get the citation from you, I'll try to copy it. They Actually, don't I am through Apple News too. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, yeah they don't times. let you, um, uh, PDF stuff, I don't think, though. You have to copy the, uh, the article. Yeah. Um, what's the, the connection? Um, how real and how uh, mutually uh, influential uh, are Putin and, uh, what is it, Krill? Krill, yeah. Krill. Krill, I'm sorry. Kirill, yeah. Well, let, let's, let's put it this way. Going back into history, uh, when Constantinople, well, let's put it this way, when the great schism happened in the 11th century, uh, Constantinople felt, you know, from hundreds of years earlier, they were the new Rome. At that time, really, uh, when, when the Roman Empire fell, Rome became simply a backwater. Uh, the Roman Empire was led from the east, from Constantinople. Now, that's their view at, at any rate. And that, 
there was no sense at all of separation of church and state. So that the Byzantine Empire was basically, they felt blessed and supported by the church, by the patriarch. Uh, so there was no particular, I mean, they were fighting with one another from time to time, but the, 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 there, was, there was no sense that, that the, um, the Christian church was really distinct from the empire. And from the fall of the Roman empire, from the fall of Rome to uh, the fall of Constantinople, uh, Constantinople felt itself to be the new Rome, the second Rome, religiously uh, at least equal to the Pope in Rome. Now that's kind of what gave rise to the, to, to the whole schism between Orthodox and Western Catholic. So then when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks, even though the Ottomans re or allowed the reestablishment of a Greek Orthodox patriarchy, Russia considered, Moscow considered itself to be the new Rome. They considered themselves to be the standard bearer, if you will, of Christendom. And that has been their dominant view ever since with a minor aberration in the Soviet Union when communism took over and, and officially imposed atheism. With the fall of the Soviet Union, that was the fall of communism and now the reestablishment of Russian Orthodoxy as the standard bearer for Christendom. And so in a sense, um, Putin feels justified religiously in doing what he's doing because he is upholding uh, Christian values against a decadent West. And, and, and you know, I, I don't think you can understand his view, distorted as it is, I think we would all admit without understanding that, that he, has a, he has a deeply religious, you know, for him, religion isn't a simply a, um, an intensely personal thing as it is say with Joe Biden. For him, religion is the, the uh, birthright of the Russian people and the Russian nation. And he won't distinguish between the Russian people and the Russian nation. What's good for the nation is good for the people, whether they like it or not, you know? So I, I think that the, the, the religious dimension behind Putin, it may be difficult for us in the West to understand, but I think it's a very, very real one uh, because we have been accustomed through the Protestant Reformation of seeing religion very much in the terms of individual morality and communal morality in the sense that this is something that I as an individual can, can buy. I think they are able to make that distinction between individual morality and, and uh, what's good for the state, what's good for the people. I think we would see that as distorted very problematic, but I, th I think that's there. You know, again, check out some of those articles about Putin's religious religiosity. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> part of what's motivating my question. And, and, and here we have the, the Ukraine, uh, which was part of the Russian church, uh, now defying Kirill? Actually, yeah. Uh, it's, it's more complicated than that because Ukraine, Kiev, was actually the origin of Russian Christianity. 
It was Vladimir the first in where what when was it? Nine hundreds, who was baptized, and he was the king of the Kievan Rus. Uh, the Russians, as they are now in Moscow, were a later development. So they lay their, I mean, Russians, and I think the Russian Orthodox Church and and the czars. And see, Putin, Putin fancies himself as a czar. He's the heir of the czars. And and so he's going to. Uh, kind of reclaim the heritage that is that he feels is theirs because um, Ukraine and Kiev and 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 Moscow are so intimately uh, united in their origins. So uh, you know, our sense of history tends to go back a century or so. His sense of history goes back millennia. Good insight. Good. Thank you. Um, may I change subject back to my Lenten resolution? I am in touch with Dick Sokol's wife, Les hmm. Yeah. And if you're not aware, she has had to put him in an institution, and their structure is for the first two weeks no contact. They have a program to work with him and build a trust relationship to help him going forward. And so Leslie, his wife, sent me the address, which I will send to you. And the institution, it's called Pavilions of El Dorado Hills. Pavilions invites our cards and letters and pictures no sooner than the 6th. I thought it was the 14th or 17th, but it's the 6th of this month. Two days. So starting <laughs> next week sometime. But I will send you this. I think you know how okay. close I was okay. over the years with Sokol and to see such a bright, bright fellow Flipping the way he is. He's blessed to have a wife, Leslie, and blessed, it appears, to have this pavilions of El Dorado Hills. So I'll send you the address and information. And Leslie said it may even be down the line that he can get phone calls, but they need to do it in a professional step-by-step -step way. So Excuse me a moment. John, would he, would he recognize uh, names like uh, Ned Chavira and George Ferrick and George Crook? And... I, I bet not. But... I, I didn't hear the first part. What was the question? Would, would uh, uh, so uh, recognize, it's, let's say a phone call comes in and they, they hand him the telephone and it's a uh, uh, George Farrick at the other end. Will he remember George Farrick's name or, I would, or George Crook? I have no way to know for sure, but I would suggest, as I'm going to do, I'm going to do it with cards and letters for a while. And then we'll see if that, these people are pretty proactive. So my guess is that if a phone call came in, and there was already a letter or a, a card or some pictures from the same person, they could say, oh, we have a call from and hand him Picture. the card the card, <clears throat> letter. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. yeah. The theory, sure. That's what I think is the very logical procedure, but keep them in your prayers and especially Leslie. She has been amazing as his, you know, it's been four or five years of gradual deterioration. Um, a blessed blessing. Wow. Thanks. Thanks, Johnny. Keep us Thank in, you, John. Yeah. Keep us I, up I to keep date. coming back, John, to 
I think I mentioned this last week, uh, by the end of his life, Ronald Reagan had no memory that he had ever been president of the United States. My goodness. Paul Flash. Imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to have to go. Well, okay, well bye, George. Bye. 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 Luck on stirring the pot for us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. God, Take care. Have a good week. Shall we? Uh, so we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens from Bob Beno and Frank Daly. Yeah, that will that okay. will be good to know. Thank you for sharing Bye. that. For doing it. Bye bye. Should we call it a day? Yeah, I think. Have so. that closing reflection. I can get it up on the screen almost instantly. Not quite instantly, but. It's got my copy. Um, Beloved, remember. Tim, are you yeah. still with us in sound? No, he's gone. He's been gone. Okay, I think I can get it on the share screen now. It's the... Yes. Thank okay. you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved, remember that you are dust and to dust you will return. You will die. This is true. And this is true too. God breathed life into you, imagined goodness for you, and remains with you amid every joy and every sorrow. Beauty is written into our being grace in every breath, gift in every heartbeat. So go out into the world to love and be loved and to serve and bear witness. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Amen. So shall we bid farewell? Or, yeah, or I, I just emailed everybody a uh, Riley Ace of Spies commercial. Uh, <laughs> just copy it and paste it in if you're interested. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What kind of guy I am. God bless. Yeah, you're a good guy. <laughs> you're all good. God bless. Thank you. See y'all. See y'all. Bye-bye. <laughs>